when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east. Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2 states, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Now today's sermon is a little bit different because we're going to delve into the background and tales and history of some of the characters that we encounter in this portion of the gospel. In addition to King Herod and the wise men, we'll also look at the symbolic meaning of the gifts presented to Jesus and also the prophecies concerning his birth. Finally, we'll examine a so-called controversy surrounding one of the prophecies. Now let's begin by looking first at the wise men. Immediately, we want to refute the popular notion that has captured the imagination of both Christendom and the secular world, which asserts that there were three wise men who visited Jesus after he was born. Although the Bible makes no mention of their specific number, it is commonly assumed that there were three wise men because of the three gifts which they presented to Jesus, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We'll get to the symbolic significance of these gifts in a moment, but scripture is silent, not only regarding the number of the wise men, but somewhat at first as to the mystery of their identity. Popular conceptions have attributed to the wise men different titles and names, including magi, kings, priests, and astrologers. The King James Bible refers to them as wise men who came from the East, and that is how I too will refer to them. It is fascinating that such scant attention is given to the wise men in the Gospel of Matthew, yet countless theories, traditions, and tall yarns have been spun around the mystery of their identity. Some believe that the wise men were kings from ancient Persia or Babylon, Others see the wise men as astrologers who inquired of the times and the seasons from the stars. While it appears somewhat ambiguous on the surface, since Matthew makes little mention of their identity, thankfully, as we've discussed in past sermons, the Bible itself has its own built-in Bible dictionary, which helps us define its own language. So when in doubt, we turn to the first instance of the occurrence of a phrase, or word in the Bible and allow the Bible to interpret itself. Using the Bible's built-in dictionary, we find that the first occurrence of the phrase wise men is in Genesis 41.8, in which Pharaoh of Egypt has a disturbing dream that he can't interpret. And so he calls for all the magicians and all the wise men to interpret his dream. Genesis 41.8 says, And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream. Notice the phrase, all the magicians and all the wise men. There's a repetition that occurs there associating those two words immediately together. This is repeated again in Exodus 7:11, the very next mention of wise men in the Bible, where the phrase wise men is associated with sorcerers and magicians. Exodus 7:11 states, "Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments." But then we get to Exodus chapter 36, and the phrase wise men is again used, but this time it's a little bit different. It's associated this time with those whom the Bible calls wise-hearted men, in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work 
all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary in Exodus 36 1. Verse 4 continues And all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work which they made. But this is the exception to the rule, and the language used to describe the wise men here is different than elsewhere in the scriptures, such as in the book of Esther. The Persian king, King Ahasuerus, references wise men when speaking of, quote, those which knew the times in Esther 1.13. As a final proof that the case can be made that the wise men were in fact associated with sorcery or astrology is revealed in the book of Daniel chapter 5 verse 15 in which King Belshazzar of Babylon states, And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof. So again, when we look at the Bible's built-in dictionary, these words wise men and astrologers and magicians are closely associated with one another. It's clear that the phrase wise men held spiritual, religious, and often occult significance with the exception of the wise-hearted men who worked in the sanctuary of the Lord with Moses but even they were doing spiritual work. To some, this is troubling indeed, that the wise men who brought gifts unto Jesus and worshipped him were in fact very likely astrologers or magicians with some kind of pagan priestly origin. But you have to understand that God will call people from anywhere in any situation in any religion, and all who call upon him will be saved if they believe. Romans 10.13 states, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 2.21 reaffirms the same message, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I believe the wise men were pagan astrologers who heard God's call, forsook all, followed his star, and came to worship Jesus, bowing down before him in complete submission, and were saved. However, more noteworthy than the identity of the wise men is the fact that the wise men were the first Gentile believers recorded in the New Testament. As such, from the very first moment of Jesus' birth, the fact is established in our minds, whether subconsciously or overtly, that salvation is now available through Jesus to all who will believe. Salvation is no longer of the Jews only, but now available to all who will put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, including the wise men who followed his star from the east. Now about the star itself. The star that the wise men followed had prophetic and symbolic significance as a cosmic sign, signaling the advent of the coming Christ. Numbers 24.17 states, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. That prophecy was fulfilled in the star which the wise men followed. Look also at Isaiah 60 verse 3 and the gentiles shall come to thy light and the king and kings to the brightness of thy rising gentiles can refer back to the wise men themselves thy light is a reference to god's light and can also be a reference to the star itself which they followed and thy rising is a reference to christ's incarnation and birth it's significant also that the wise men didn't call it a star or the star, but his star, referring to Christ himself. Now another popular notion that I want to deal with is the belief that the wise men were kings. Turn with me if you would to Isaiah 60 and Psalm 72, and just hold your fingers there between those two spots, and I'll explain a little background about that. While prophecies 
concerning the wise men as kings is not as abundant in scripture as them being astrologers, a compelling case can still be made that the wise men may have also been royalty from Midian and Sheba, which were kingdoms to the east and south of Jerusalem in what is present day Yemen. In fact, some have called the wise men priest kings, combining these concepts together and calling them royal astrologers. And I'll explain in a moment as we look at, this, at the two verses. This is actually plausible when we look at the two key passages from Isaiah 60 and Psalm 72, which mention two of the same three gifts, gold and incense, being presented to the Lord as gifts from kings of faraway lands. So we just read in Isaiah 60 verse 3 that Gentiles and kings would come to his light. Again it said, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Now continue the same passage, reading in verse 4, the very next word, verse, Lift up thine eyes round about, and see, all they gather themselves together. They come to thee, thy sons shall come from afar. Skipping down to verse 6, The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and incense. And then in verse 9 we read also, Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold, with them unto the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel. Now, there's more. I mean, this is, this is sort of a partial match, but if you turn to Psalm 72, a parallelism occurs which strengthens the case further. Granted, this is part speculation since only two of the three gifts are mentioned, but if you notice in the Isaiah passage, there are several key phrases to keep in mind as we compare this passage to Psalm 72. So if you remember, in Isaiah it said, all they from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and incense, and also that the ships of Tarshish would bring sons from afar. Keep that in mind as we read Psalm 72, starting in verse 10. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents, the kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. Further down in verse 15 of the same psalm, it reads, And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. So we have Sheba, and Tarshish, and gold, and incense, and sons from afar in Isaiah 60. And in Psalm 72, we have a parallelism which mentions Sheba, and Tarshish, and gold, and Gentile kings, falling down before him. It sounds a lot like the Gentile wise men of the East presenting gifts of gold, frankincense, which is incense, and myrrh to the Lord. Uh, while this is a partial prophetic match, it is difficult to ignore, and a case is made that the wise men may have in fact been kings from Sheba and Midian, which is to the east and south of Jerusalem. Now, we come to the three gifts presented to the child Jesus. The gift of gold is symbolic of royalty and material wealth. In ancient times, it is kings who are often in possession of it, and it is a gift truly fit for a king. Gold is associated with holiness, purity, and divinity in the Bible also. The entire temple of God and the Holy of Holies was overlaid with pure gold, as well as the Ark of the Covenant. The golden candlestick near the entrance to the Holy of Holies was also made of one solid piece of pure gold. The cherubims were overlaid with gold and so on. I mean, the whole thing was just covered in gold. Gold signifies then God's purity and intrinsic value and is a fitting gift for the child, Jesus. The next gift presented to Jesus was frankincense. So what is frankincense? 
Frankincense is a dry resinous substance often used as a perfume in ancient times. Frankincense was also one of the key ingredients in the anointing oil which Aaron and the priests used in the Holy of Holies. As anointing oil, frankincense foreshadows Jesus as the anointed one. Christ itself is the Greek word for anointed. So you can see how anointing oil would fit the anointed one, right? Um, so frankincense refers to Christ himself as the high priest, which would replace the priesthood of Aaron. And lastly, this is one that is um, not known to many. Frankincense was also placed in the meat offerings made by fire in the Old Testament as a sweet smelling savor and a memorial unto the Lord. Leviticus 2 states, and when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, with all the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar, to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now, some of you know I got a lot more extensively into this in my sermon, uh, Did Jesus Suffer in Hell?, this is yet another proof that Jesus Christ himself was a burnt offering on our behalf. So frankincense, therefore, also foreshadows Christ as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. This brings us to myrrh. Myrrh was the final gift presented to the child Jesus. Myrrh is also not exactly the pleasant gift that you might think of when you see all the manger scenes and think about all the pleasant children's songs and tales woven around these gifts. Myrrh is a resin that is harvested from certain trees in Eastern Arabia. It's been used historically as a spice, a perfume, and as medicine. But it was also used in embalming, which preserves dead bodies and slows down decomposition. So, if you remember in Mark uh, chapter 15 also, Jesus was given wine to drink mixed with myrrh, which he refused. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not in Mark 15 verse 23. Myrrh foreshadows then Jesus' death on the cross. So in short, gold represents Jesus' kingship, Frankincense primarily represents his priesthood, and myrrh represents his death on the cross. Now, we've already talked about the wise men being astrologers, but the question, I want to raise the question again as to whether the wise men were led by divination of the stars to Jesus, or whether they were led by God himself. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 through 12 states, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh a son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. So then how do we reconcile all this? Were the wise men participating in astrology, or were they following a divinely ordained sign? In other words, was God leading them? While the Bible affirms that the wise men were astrologers, I firmly believe that God was supernaturally guiding them for his own providential purposes, despite their past sordid religious practices. The Bible tells us that the stars are the handiwork of God in Genesis 1, 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. The primary application of this passage is that the stars are meant as markers of time and space. For example, we base time in our clocks on the rotation of the planets and the stars. Sailors also traveling the seas use the stars to mark geographic positions using the stars as signs. 
That, I believe, is the primary application of Genesis 1.14. But there are instances in which the stars are not only used for calculating time and marking space, but at God's holy discretion and at His discretion alone, He has used the stars biblically as supernatural and miraculous signs to communicate His intentions towards mankind. One of the most striking examples in the Bible of God using the physical elements of the universe as a sign is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 38. While you're turning to Isaiah 38, let me give you the background on that passage. In Isaiah 38, King Hezekiah is sick unto death. And Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and prays unto the Lord and beseeches him to have mercy on him. God answers through Isaiah the prophet and tells him that he will add 15 years to his life and deliver him out of the hand of the king of Assyria. In Isaiah 38, verse 7 and 8, the Bible records, And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it was gone down. This was a cosmic sign which declared God's intentions toward King Hezekiah. So we witness here a miracle of truly astronomical proportions within the stars, within the sun itself. Now either time actually reversed itself 10 degrees on the ancient sundial of Ahaz, or perhaps the position of the sun actually changed and went backwards relative to the earth or vice versa. Whatever the case may be, a sign was performed among the stars. This is God's prerogative. He can do that at will as he did with the star that led the wise men to Jesus, and it is not astrology. God moved the cosmos to suit his own purposes. So there's a vast difference between man seeking the counsel of the stars to foretell the times and the author of creation moving the cosmos at his will to advance his providential plans. God will use the totality of his universe at his own discretion to accomplish his purposes. Now, there's a huge difference also between astronomy, which maps the law of the stars as a physical science, versus astronomy, which charts the zodiac. So, you know, I don't want to know what your sign is, okay? I mean, if, if you're a Christian that dabbles in horoscopes, you're taking part in a very wicked, satanic, biblically forbidden act, even if you think it's not real or you're just doing it as a pastime because it's in your favorite magazine or something. You know, so if you want God to bless you, don't even think about doing such things. But astronomy as a physical science is another matter altogether. The Bible mentions the constellations, such as in the book of Job, where Arcturus, Orion, and the Pleiades are named in Job 9.9. And even the Lord himself mentions the constellations in Job 38, 31. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion, says the Lord in, in Job 38, 31. The prophet Amos also says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion and turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day dark with night in Amos 5, 8. But when it comes to astrology, Isaiah gives God's people a stern warning. Turning again to Isaiah, the Bible says, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be a stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. Now let's turn our eyes 
in judgment to King Herod. The first thing we have to realize when we're dealing with King Herod is that there were multiple King Herods in the Gospels and also in the Book of Acts. I want to give you some general background about the various Herods so that you can differentiate between them when reading the Bible. History records that the Herodian dynasty started from a man named Antipater, whom Julius Caesar made procurator of Judea. While we don't put any stock whatsoever in secular history when it comes to Bible truth, it can be helpful as a matter of interest to understand some of the narratives surrounding some of the more minor Bible characters like the Herods. I mean, we all know that history can be changed and often is. Often the official narrative is changed to suit a particular agenda. So if you read history bearing that in mind, rather than reading it the same way that you would the trustworthy Bible, it can still be helpful at times and we shouldn't remain willfully ignorant as long as we don't mix up history knowledge with Bible authority. When I read the Bible, I know that every word is true. When I read history, it's just history. So before I go on further, let me make it crystal clear if I didn't already. It's not necessary to even have a rudimentary understanding of history or ancient societies or cultures in order to understand the Bible. The Bible is complete in and of itself. All that we need is contained within its holy pages, especially when it comes to matters of understanding God, salvation, doctrine, church matters, and morality. The purpose of the Bible is to teach us about the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ to the salvation of our souls. But history can be helpful in getting a fuller picture of some of the more minor personalities such as, like we mentioned, King Herod. I mean, does it really matter if you know anything at all about King Herod in terms of understanding God or salvation? No. But is it interesting for study? I think it can be. So, with that in mind, the first Herod that we meet in the Gospel of Matthew is son of Herod Antipas, who, as I mentioned before, was made the first procurator of Judea after Julius Caesar defeated Pompey. Procurator, if you don't know, was in charge of the financial matters of a given province. He was sort of like the treasure, uh, secretary of treasury over all Judea, but with immense political power. History records that Antipater, King Herod's father, was of Edomian descent, which is another name for being an Edomite. The Edomites, the Bible tells us, are the descendants of Esau. So the Herods were of Edomite lineage and due to their genealogy were sort of considered half-Jews, half-breeds of sorts, and basically the Jews of Judea didn't really respect the Herods as rightful kings of Judea. After Antipater, the first Judean procurator, Herod the Great, becomes the first king of Judea. And it is this Herod that we first encounter in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. He's referred to as Herod the Great. This was the same Herod that had the original Temple of Solomon rebuilt. He was also known for his great feats of architecture, but that's not all he was known for. Herod was a truly wicked and despicable man. Historians write of Herod that he was, quote, not only Edomian in race and a Jew in religion, but he was a heathen in practice and a monster in character. Other sources describe Herod as a madman who murdered his own family and a man prepared to commit any crime in order to gratify his unbounded ambition. Scripture bears record that this portion of history is accurate when we see that Herod tries to recruit the wise men into spying out the location of the child Jesus in Matthew 2 and the wise men refuse. Herod has all the children of Bethlehem and the surrounding regions, ages two and under, slaughtered. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, 
and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Matthew 2.16 now, very quickly, before we get into the remaining Herods, I want to refute one other false notion, which is that the wise men visited Jesus at the moment of his birth and presented gifts to Jesus right there and then in the manger and stable with Mary and Joseph. Yeah, sorry, your nativity scenes are all wrong. But hey, it's fine. It's just a symbolic representation. So, Matthew 2.11 states, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. A house where they saw the young child is not the same as a stable where the baby Jesus lay. The only thing we know for certain is that Jesus would have been somewhere between the age of two and under when the wise men visited him. We know this because after Herod inquired diligently of the wise men about the time of Jesus' birth, he reached the same conclusion and had all the children ages two and under ruthlessly murdered. So back to the Herodian dynasty. And you can take this history portion for, you know, like I said, it's not scripture. It's just some background that you can take with a grain of salt. So as I mentioned, history records that the King Herod of Matthew 2, known as Herod the Great, had his own family members murdered, including one of his nine wives, on suspicion of adultery. Later, while on his deathbed, five days before he died, Herod ordered the execution of his own son. While on his deathbed, history records that Herod commanded that all the chief men of the entire Jewish nation be killed at the moment of his own death, so that he would, quote, have the honor of a memorable mourning at his own funeral. Basically, he wanted a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth at the moment of his own death, knowing he wouldn't get any otherwise. The order, however, was not carried out after he died. After Herod's death, his kingdom was divided into a tetrarchy. A tetrarchy is a kingdom where power is split among either four or uh, four people, or over four regions. Herod split the power over the various regions and divided it between his sons. Herod Archelaus is one of the sons. This is the second Herod that is mentioned in Matthew, chapter 2, verse 22, not to be confused with the first King Herod. Archelaus was not much better than his father. History records that on one occasion of a Passover, he slew 3,000 Jews till the temple was, quote, full of dead bodies. It is no wonder then, knowing the base character of the Herods, that the Bible records Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, even after being told to return to Judea by an angel of the Lord in a dream, was still afraid to return. Matthew 2, verses 21 and 22 state, and he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. This takes us to Herod Antipas. The third Herod mentioned in the Gospels is Herod Antipas. History regards Antipas as a shy, sneaky character. Jesus himself refers to Antipas as a fox in Luke 13, 32. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Herod Antipas is the same Herod whom John the Baptist rebukes for marrying his half-brother's wife, Herodias, while they were both still married. Herodias, in turn, compels Herod, uh, Herod Antipas to have John the Baptist beheaded later in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. 
As a side note, John the Baptist teaches us that it's perfectly within the right of God's people to rebuke heads of state, kings and presidents and congressmen, and leaders indiscriminately as God's prophets. I mean, how many times have we rebuked King Obama, for example? Only to have some weak-kneed Christian tell us to just love and pray for him and that it's not Christ-like to harshly judge the sins of the wicked kings and princes and so-called presidents. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never read any examples of John the Baptist praying for King Herod and just loving on him, have you? John the Baptist paid a martyr's price and the voice of one crying in the wilderness was physically silenced for a time on this earth. But his spirit continues to speak loudly to us in the words of scripture even today. Herod Antipas is also the very same Herod in the Gospels who performed a show trial of sorts over Jesus' rightful claim to kingship before returning him to stand trial before Pilate. Luke 23 verses 8 and 9 say, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. Jesus refused to cast his pearls before swine. There are times when it's best to remain silent. It is also from this Herod Antipas that Jesus receives the royal robe which he wears to the inauguration of his crucifixion. Luke 23, 11 states, And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. Another interesting side note, Herod Antipas and Pilate in their treacherous treatment of Jesus become friends who were formerly at enmity with one another. Luke 23, 12 states, And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. The Bible tells us that the wicked delight in each other's company. Isn't this encounter with Herod and Pilate perfect, uh, perfectly reflected by the words of the Bible in Psalm 2, which says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. It's a perfect description of Herod Antipas and Pilate colluding to kill the Lord Jesus Christ and another prophecy fulfilled. By contrast, the word of God says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Let's just very briefly look at another Herod. I'm going to kind of just giving you the different Herods so as you read through the Gospels, you understand that they are, they are different, and there's, there's different kings that we're dealing with. Herod Philip II. The final Herod mentioned in the Gospels is Herod Philip II. He's merely a footnote in the Gospels, which merely marks the place and time in which John the Baptist began his fiery ministry. Luke 3, starting at verse 1, states, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituraea, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene. And the verse goes on and it mentions John the Baptist, the son of Zacharias, who comes out of the wilderness. So he's just a, a brief mention there in, in, uh, in the book of Luke, in the Gospel of Luke. It's ironic that Philip receives scant attention from the Bible, since all of the Herods, he alone is smiled upon by historians as being a, quote, quiet ruler who governed with the most amount of moderation. Whether history is accurate in this regard, we can only speculate that perhaps God spared Philip the insult of being largely associated with the most wicked of his own brothers by having his place in the scriptures minimized. 
The last two uh, King Herods that I want to mention is Agrippa uh, the first and second. I don't want to spend a lot of time on these two last kings uh, since our study is currently in the Gospel of Matthew. Suffice it to say that Herod Agrippa the first was the grandson of the first King Herod that we saw in Matthew. And he was the one who put James, the brother of Jesus, to death in Acts 12. And Herod Agrippa II, his son, was the one who judged Paul when Paul was being threatened with imprisonment by the Jews in Caesarea in Acts 26. King Agrippa II is attributed with the famous line in the Bible in which he says, after hearing the gospel from Paul's own mouth, he says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Acts 26, 28. So these are all the Herods mentioned in the Bible. Didn't want to spend tons of time on that, but it is important to just differentiate between the, the four that we see, or the five or so that we, that we see um, if you count the book of Acts also. Um, so I hope, th I hope this gives you some peripheral insight into the various personalities uh, going forward in the study. So the final portion that I want to look at is the fulfillment of prophecy. There are basically four prophecies that get fulfilled in the Gospel of Matthew at Jesus' birth. Three of them are very straightforward and they present no theological issues whatsoever. So we'll go through those three first more quickly. But the final one presents, on the surface at least, a small theological challenge that skeptics have called a discrepancy in the Bible. However, we know there are no errors in the Bible. Let's prove it. The first prophecy, Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 state, starting at the end of verse 5, For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So this is referring to the prophet Micah. Micah 5.2 states, But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. This one is straightforward and needs no further explanation. Jesus is born in Bethlehem and that prophecy is fulfilled. Number two, the end of Matthew 2 verse 15 states, Out of Egypt have I called my son. This is talking about Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, fleeing to Egypt to escape the treachery of Herod the Great that we talked about after being warned in a dream. This is fulfilled in the prophet Hosea's words, which state in Hosea 11.1, 1, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. In addition to that, we know that the patriarch Joseph, who was sold into slavery into Egypt and who became a ruler of Egypt also, was a foreshadowing of Christ, a Christ-like figure. And of course, the entire exodus of Moses and the children of Israel out of Egypt also foreshadows this prophecy as well. For if the children of Israel had perished in Egypt, then the seed of the Messiah would have perished along with them. Moving on to number three, Matthew 2, verses 16 through 18, we already touched on earlier regarding Herod when he, when he uh, slaughtered the children, but let's just read that. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. This prophecy is referring back to Jeremiah 31.15, which says the exact same thing. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation 
and bitter weeping. Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. So again, very straightforward in the, in the first three. There's just absolutely no controversy there. But we get to number four, and on the surface, um, the fourth prophecy of Matthew, of Gosp uh, the Gospel of Matthew, presents a slight theological challenge. But I will prove to you that there is in fact no controversy and that God's word is always as free of error in the King James Version. You'll find plenty of errors in the NIV, the NLT, the ESV, and the NASV, but never so in the tried and true KJV. Now Matthew 2 verses 22 and 23 states, But when he, Joseph, heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. Now here's the key verse in 23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So the so-called challenge is this. There is no specific Old Testament prophet who calls the Messiah a Nazarene. Okay, so what's going on here? What do we do with this? Well, the first thing that we have to get out of the way is that people sometimes mix up being a Nazarite with being from the city of Nazareth. The two have nothing at all whatsoever to do with each other. A Nazarite, in short, is someone who takes a vow to be consecrated unto the Lord for a specific period of time. A Nazarene, however, is simply someone from the city of Nazareth. Okay, the two, just two completely separate things. Jesus did not take the Nazarite vow. That's not what this is talking about. So let's just check that off the list first as an, as an interpretation error. Okay, so you say, but there's still no Old Testament scripture uh, saying that the Messiah would be from Nazareth. But here's the thing. Matthew says that the prophets, plural, said that he would be called a Nazarene. Multiple prophets who would describe Jesus in this way. Matthew, in fact, was referring to the prophecies in the Old Testament that said the Christ would be despised and rejected of men. Nazareth, a city in the lower southern region of Galilee, had earned a very poor and negative reputation for itself among the Jews of Jesus' day. To be called a Nazarene carried with it a huge stigma as being subpar in that society. In John 1.46, Nathanael himself, a man from Galilee, uh, said of Jesus, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Let's look at some of the prophecies that back this up. So basically, just to reaffirm, what, what, it, what I'm saying is that this was a description of the Messiah because Nazareth, uh, Nazareth was such a poor city. It was just, you know, it was the ghetto, basically, of, of Judea. Psalm 22, 6 uh, through 8 says, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Psalm 69.4 also states, They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. Isaiah 53 states, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. It's interesting also that Jesus himself proudly wears the title Jesus of Nazareth, Paul at the moment of his conversion states in Acts 22, 8, And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. The social stigma 
of being called a Nazarene fit perfectly the numerous prophetic descriptions of the Messiah being despised and rejected among men. So, once again, if you understand the scriptures by the Spirit of God, if you have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you, you'll understand this. And we see that there are no errors in God's holy word. Only skeptics who as natural men cannot discern the things of God, they can't understand the things of the Spirit because they are spiritually discerned. Now that we've looked in depth at the various issues in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, and studied the background of the new personalities which are introduced, such as the wise men and the King Herods, I hope this has given you a fuller picture of the events which follow the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please join us next time for Matthew 3, which will cover John the Baptist. Godspeed.